Hello, it's Adam from the Judah Chest here. A quick note before we get into the show to let you know that I also release a weekly subscriber-only podcast episode. For just £3.99 a month via Apple Podcasts or £5 per month via Patreon, which also comes with a whole host of other benefits, you can listen in ad-free to all episodes that I release. To sign up to this, search for the Tudor Chess Podcast in Apple Podcasts or sign up via patreon.com forward slash the Tudor Chest. To the old nobility of England, he was a jumped up oik. To the common people, he was the man who destroyed the monasteries. In short, Thomas Cromwell was a man with few friends, but this didn't really matter, for he held the favour of the most important person alive in England at the time, King Henry VIII. Cromwell transformed the Tudor court in a way that no other royal servant in history has ever done. He was the creator of what we would now recognise as true English governance. He rose from relative obscurity to being made the Earl of Essex, but like so many at the time, when his favour with the king invariably ran out, he, like all other royal servants, was dispensable. Since his death in 1540, he has been characterised as one of the key villains from Tudor England, the man responsible for the execution of Anne Boleyn, the man who tore apart the monasteries and put the money directly into the king's coffers. And whilst his actions were indeed shocking, he was also undeniably committed to religious reform and was loyal to a fault to his king, a fact which is ironic given that it would be a descendant of his family, Oliver Cromwell, who ultimately destroyed the monarchy in the following century. King Henry VIII, who sent countless people to their deaths throughout his long reign, very, very rarely voiced regret at any of his decisions, but he freely admitted after Cromwell's execution that he had never had a more faithful servant. As Sir Mark Rylance returns to the role of Thomas Cromwell for season two of the spectacular and critically acclaimed series Wolf Hall, there is no more apposite time to explore the life of this most controversial figure from Tudor England, Thomas Cromwell, Earl of Essex, Henry VIII's most faithful servant. Welcome back to the Tudor Chest Podcast, Episode 15, Thomas Cromwell, King Henry VIII's Most Faithful Servant. Although Cromwell's exact origins are not definitively known, it is generally believed that he was born and raised in Putney, which was then part of the county of Surrey, but is now in southwest London. He was born around 1485 to Walter Cromwell, a blacksmith and brewer, who has become known as something of a ruffian. For example, rumours have abounded that he found himself on the wrong side of the law once or twice, supposedly fined for watering down the ale that he'd sold. Although this seems more likely to have been mere gossip cooked up to discredit his son at a later stage. For what we do know is that Walter Cromwell was regularly called upon for jury service and was elected the Constable of Putney in 1495, not exactly the sort of post that would be filled by a known criminal. Thomas's mother is believed to have been Catherine Meverell, who came from a gentry family in Staffordshire in the West Midlands. She lived in Putney in the house of a local attorney, John Welbeck, at the time of her marriage to Walter in 1474. And so whilst Thomas Cromwell's origins were certainly not nearly as grand as the men who would later become his peers, the likes of the Duke of Norfolk or the Marquess of Exeter, he was not a complete nobody. He was not as baseborn as history likes to paint him. At some point in his youth, Thomas Cromwell left the family home and crossed the Channel into Europe. He would spend a great deal of time in various parts of the continent, where, rather like Anne Boleyn, he learned his craft. He met people from all walks of life. He saw how the world truly worked. Cromwell spent time in Italy, France and the Low Countries, areas which now refer to Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. Accounts of his activities from the time are sketchy and contradictory. He was believed to have briefly served in both the French and the Italian armies and may have even once gone into a battle against the English. However, he eventually fell into poverty. Whilst living on the streets in Florence, he came into the service of a Florentine banker, Francesco Frescobaldi, 
who had spotted Cromwell starving in the streets and given him a roof over his head. After leaving Italy, he travelled to the burgeoning mercantile centres of the Low Countries, living among the English merchants who had struck gold. It was here that Cromwell developed both a network of contacts and the ability to speak several languages. He also saw firsthand how money worked, experience that would put him in good stead later down the line. In 1518, Thomas Cromwell returned to Rome, this time on behalf of St Mary's Guild in Boston, Lincolnshire. The purpose of his trip was to gain Pope Leo's continued approval for the sale of various profitable indulgences. Now, an indulgence was not what it sounds like in the modern sense. Cromwell wasn't going to Rome to get the Pope's sign-off to eat fuck tons of cake. An indulgence was basically a paid-for fast pass to absolve someone of their sins. Yep, you paid the church and your prayers basically got bumped ahead of the queue. Now, given Cromwell's later fierce commitment to religious reform, it's likely that this experience, ironically, opened his eyes to the huge scope for abuse of power that this particular part of the Catholic Church supported. It was also during this time that Cromwell came to the attention of the great theologian Desiderius Erasmus and his new edition of the Gospels, Erasmus's work made Cromwell begin to doubt the legitimacy of the practice that he was advocating, and Cromwell's biographer, the wonderful Dr Tracy Borman, goes further still, suggesting that it was at this point that Cromwell developed his strong contempt for the papacy. Cromwell had not remained entirely outside of England throughout his whole time, though, for in 1515 he married Elizabeth Wicks, who would go on to give Thomas three children, Gregory, born in 1520, and then two daughters, Anne, born around 1522, and Grace, in around 1527. Devastatingly for Thomas Cromwell, his family was completely torn apart during an outbreak of the dreaded sweating sickness in 1529, which claimed the lives of both his wife and his daughters. And although he would not be alive to witness it, Cromwell's son Gregory also died of the illness in the 1540s. By 1520, Cromwell was living permanently back in England and having cut his teeth on the continent, put that experience to good work and was firmly established in London's mercantile and legal circles. By 1523, he had obtained a seat in the House of Commons as a burgess, a now obsolete title which at the time referred to someone responsible for a particular borough. It's somewhat comparable with what we might now call a local councillor. His first forays into the world of the nobility came in 1523, when he became a legal advisor to Thomas Gray, the second Marquess of Dorset. This led to his coming to the attention of the Lord Chancellor, Thomas Wolsey, who by 1524 had taken Cromwell on as part of his household. His former negative experiences with the Catholic Church in Rome now came to the forefront, for he assisted in the dissolution of nearly 30 monasteries, which although ostensibly was done to raise funds for Wolsey to found the King's School Ipswich and Cardinal College Oxford, was more likely personally satisfying for Cromwell himself. By 1529, Cromwell was personally appointed by Wolsey to form part of his council as one of his most senior and trusted advisers. Unfortunately, by this stage, a certain young brunette was well established at the court and was entirely ripping up the status quo. I am talking, of course, about Anne Boleyn. Her and King Henry VIII's love affair and the latter's determination to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon was, of course, the biggest challenge that Wolsey ever faced and when he was unable to secure the annulment, he soon felt the pinch of King Henry VIII's displeasure. Wolsey's fall from grace naturally impacted his closest allies, with Cromwell one such figure. Interestingly, however, Cromwell's unwillingness to utterly discount his former patron may very well have been a major factor in King Henry VIII's own initial warmth towards him. The court of Henry VIII was a hotbed of intrigue, of suspicion, power politics and betrayal, to coin a modern phrase, no one wanted to be seen too close to a drowning man, and yet Cromwell remained loyal to Wolsey throughout, which George Cavendish, Wolsey's first biographer, suggests actually endeared him to the king. This was not a man who would jump ship, but instead stand by his supporter, irrelevant of the status quo. For the king, surrounded as he was by flatterers, such loyalty and transparency was equal parts refreshing as it was believable. 
Cromwell successfully overcame the shadow cast over his career by Wolsey's downfall, and by November 1529 he had secured a seat in Parliament as a member for Taunton in Somerset, and was reported as being in great favour with Henry VIII. Around a year later, in December of 1530, Cromwell's stock rose greatly, for he was appointed by the King to the Privy Council. Cromwell had well and truly arrived. One of the most significant people from Henry's court that would come to utterly define Cromwell's life and his later reputation is Anne Boleyn. From 1527, Henry VIII had sought to have his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled so that he could lawfully marry Anne. The overall basis for the annulment and what it meant beyond a simple royal divorce is too detailed to cover here, but simply put, the champions of the annulment not only believed that Catherine was unlawfully Henry VIII's queen, but also acted with self-interest in mind, for the situation provided an opportunity to enforce major religious reform. By the autumn of 1531, Thomas Cromwell had taken control of the supervision of the King's legal and parliamentary affairs, working closely with Sir Thomas Audley. Cromwell was now part of the inner circle of the King's Council, and by the spring of 1532 he had begun to exert influence over elections to the House of Commons. The third session of what is now known as the Reformation Parliament had been scheduled for October 1531, but was postponed until the 15th of January 1532 because of Henry VIII's indecision as to the best way to proceed towards the annulment with Catherine of Aragon. Cromwell favoured the assertion of royal supremacy over the recalcitrant church, and he manipulated support in the House of Commons for the measure by resurrecting anti-clerical grievances expressed earlier in the session of 1529. Once he had achieved his goal of managing affairs in Parliament, he never relinquished it. In March of 1532, speaking without royal permission, he urged the House of Commons to draw up a list of clerical abuses in need of reform. On the 18th of March 1532, the Commons delivered a supplication to the King denouncing clerical abuses and the power of the ecclesiastical courts, and describing Henry as the only head, sovereign lord, protector and defender of the Church. On the 14th of May 1532, Parliament was prorogued. Two days later, Sir Thomas More resigned his post as Lord Chancellor, realising that the battle to save the marriage with Catherine of Aragon was now lost. Henry and his sweetheart Anne Boleyn formally married on the 25th of January 1533, although it is speculated that a secret marriage had taken place on the 14th of November 1532. If there were a secret marriage in November, then it was clearly not done on the basis that Anne was already pregnant, for she gave birth to Elizabeth in September 1533, which places the date of conception around January of that year. Cromwell's ever-growing power was soon given full scope, for in February of 1534 he introduced a new bill restricting the right to make appeals to Rome, reasserting the long-standing historical fiction that England was an empire, and thus not subject to external jurisdiction. In March of that same year, Thomas Cranmer, a former chaplain of the Berlins, was given the mother of all promotions when he was consecrated as Archbishop of Canterbury. This was comparable in some respects with Thomas Becket 400 years earlier, who went from Lord Chancellor into the Archbishopric of Canterbury, the purpose of which was to make the church more agreeable to the king's desires. Convocation immediately declared King Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine as unlawful, and in the first week of April 1533, Parliament passed Cromwell's bill into law as the Act in Restraint of Appeals, ensuring that any adjudication concerning the king's marriage could not be challenged in Rome. In May, the marriage between Henry and Catherine was deemed null and invalid and contrary to the law of God. Five days later, Cranmer pronounced the king's marriage to Anne to be lawful, and on the 1st of June, 1533, she was crowned Queen of England. Cromwell's next major appointment came in April 1534, when the king confirmed him as principal secretary and chief minister, which in truth was a position that he had held for some time, in all but name. This just made it official. Cromwell immediately took steps to enforce the Act of Supremacy legislation, which passed through Parliament without fail. Before the members of both houses returned home on the 30th of March, they were required to swear an oath accepting the Act of Succession, and all of the King's subjects were now required to swear to the legitimacy of the marriage with Anne Boleyn, and by implication to accept the King's new powers and the break from Rome. 
two of the biggest challengers to Cromwell's new policies were Sir Thomas More and John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, both of whom refused to agree. More was taken into custody on the same day and was moved to the Tower of London on the 17th of April, where Fisher joined him four days later. Both men would eventually lose their lives on the executioner's scaffold for their actions. In November 1534, Parliament was reconvened and it was during this meeting that Cromwell brought forward one of his most infamous and explosive pieces of legislation from his whole career. Treason had been a capital punishment for centuries, but exactly what treason was had evolved over time. Cromwell's 1534 revisions to the Treasons Act 1352 totally transformed the definition of treason and would duly result in many more convictions than ever seen before, for it was made treason to speak of or even think, yes, think, rebellious words against the royal family, to deny their titles or to call the king a heretic, tyrant, infidel or usurper. If someone casually discussed or wondered how old the king would be when he died, for example, they had imagined the king's death and under this new piece of legislation, they were therefore guilty, technically, of treason. The Act of Supremacy also clarified the king's position as head of the church in England. Cromwell's relationship with Henry VIII's second wife, Anne Boleyn, had generally been strong. Together they had schemed and connived to orchestrate Anne's path to the throne, and both were committed to religious reform. It was in this latter point, however, that their relationship eventually took a major turn. Anne Boleyn had always been a controversial figure, and like Cromwell, she had few major supporters, which perhaps explains why they formed a close bond. But as Anne Boleyn's own power with the king began to wane, following her not providing Henry with a healthy male heir, the relationship with Cromwell also began to flounder. Cromwell may have once been loyal to Anne, but his biggest loyalty had always been to the king and to his own self-interest. His commitment to the king, whilst commendable to the queen, eventually led to differences between the two, for they disagreed on how revenue amassed from the closure of the lesser monasteries should be spent. At the final session of the Reformation Parliament in February 1536, the Act for the Suppression of the Lesser Monasteries had been concluded, with those with a gross income of less than £200 per annum to be closed down and their revenues directed straight into the Crown. It was this that caused a clash with Anne Boleyn, who wanted to see the proceeds of the dissolution used for educational and charitable purposes, whereas Cromwell wanted to see it going straight into the King's coffers. The gauntlet was thrown down on the 2nd of April 1536, with Anne Boleyn making the first move. Her almoner, John Skip, gave a sermon before the entire court in which he recounted the story of the good Queen Esther from the Old Testament. In the story, King Ahasuerus is tricked by his adviser, Haman, into ordering the killing of the Jews, but the Jews are then saved when Queen Esther manages to change her husband's mind, who in turn hangs Haman for his treachery. The inference was clear for the whole audience. Esther was Anne Boleyn, and Haman was Cromwell. Skip's diatribe would surely have had to have had Anne's approval, and was intended to persuade courtiers and privy councillors to change the advice that they had been giving the king, and to reject the temptation of personal gain. The sermon was taken so seriously that Skip was called before the council and accused of malice, lack of charity, sedition and even treason. Anne Boleyn may have felt like she'd won a great victory, but it ultimately backfired spectacularly. Cromwell had been one of her very few supporters, but now the pair were in open war. Anne had many enemies at court and had never been popular with the people of England who remained loyal to the former queen, Catherine of Aragon. Had Anne Boleyn given Henry VIII's sons, then none of this would have mattered. Her position would have been absolutely secure. But with only a daughter, the Princess Elizabeth, in the royal nursery, and two, possibly three, failed pregnancies, Anne was in a highly precarious position, and so Cromwell pounced. Cromwell and the King had a major row over what Henry VIII perceived was Cromwell overreaching his powers. Cromwell had championed an alliance with the imperial ambassador, and had gone to some lengths in setting it up without royal approval. The king was furious, and gave Cromwell a major dressing down in front of the whole court. There were even rumours that the king slapped him in the face. 
Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador and a long-term enemy of Anne Boleyn, made it clear that this was a big turning point for Cromwell, for Anne had always championed a French alliance, and so it was perceived that she was responsible for Henry not wishing to explore an imperial alliance instead. Chapuis also states beyond doubt that what happened next was the work of Cromwell and not the king. Following this big row with the king, Cromwell left court, pleading time to recover from pure sorrow, or to use modern parlance, he pulled a sickie. It is more likely, however, that this week-long sojourn away from the court had an altogether more sinister purpose. He would use it to plot the downfall of Anne Boleyn. Cromwell was an incredibly gifted lawyer. He knew the law, and he knew the scope of the law like the back of his hand and so he also recognised what could and could not be used as the basis for a divorce from Anne Boleyn. The fact that Anne Boleyn had not provided Henry with a son was not sufficient grounds for a divorce, nor was there a religious basis which had been the tenuous grounding behind the break from Catherine of Aragon, and in any case, Anne Boleyn was herself becoming majorly dangerous to Cromwell's own safety. With her and her family around, Cromwell was in danger, as were the policies that he hoped to see come to fruition. Anne had proven that she had an incredible knack for regaining the king's love and trust. For Cromwell, the realisation soon dawned that an annulment would not be enough. Anne Boleyn had to be destroyed completely. Luckily for Cromwell, the king himself was also growing impatient with his second wife. What so attracted Anne to Henry in the first place, her fiery temperament, her confidence and her forthright manner, were all thrilling in a mistress, but they were grating in a wife. Couple that with her not providing the long for male heir, and the fact that Henry had become enamoured with one of the Queen's ladies, a certain Jane Seymour, and a recipe for disaster was soon bubbling away against Anne Boleyn. Cromwell knew how to take all of this, condense it down, and move against Henry's second queen. Cromwell would use a combination of the rewritten 1534 treason laws and Anne's own flirtatious personality to set the trap which would see the Queen and five men all lose their lives on the executioner's scaffold. As Queen, Anne was at the centre of the court revelries and had learnt the art of flirtation on the continent in her youth. A coterie of male admirers were intermingled amongst Anne Boleyn's ladies-in-waiting, including her musician, Mark Smeaton, Francis Weston, a gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber, Henry Norris, a close friend of the King's, and also George Boleyn, Viscount Rochford, Anne's brother, all of whom vied for the Queen's attention and that of her ladies. Now, although this group flirted and gossiped, there is zero hard evidence to suggest that anything more than that ever went on. What is beyond doubt, though, is that one exchange would prove particularly explosive between Anne and Henry Norris. Norris had been courting one of Anne's cousins, Madge or Mary Shelton, but had not gone through the lengths of actually marrying her. When the Queen asked him why, he responded that he was tarrying for the love of another. Anne, ever a wit, snapped back that, You look for dead men's shoes, for if aught but anything came to the king but good, you would look to have me. In other words, you want to marry me when the king is dead. Now, whilst this was nothing but mere banter, it had a much, much darker undertone, for it referenced the king's death, and in so doing, Anne had spoken treason, based on the updated 1534 Treasons Act. Exactly how this exchange came to Cromwell is not known, nor can we say definitively when the idea of framing Anne came into being. Either way, within days, Cromwell began to gather evidence. He met with Mark Smeaton, who confessed to adultery with the Queen. Now, the evidence is split on whether Smeaton was ever tortured. My instinct tells me that he was, for he was the only one of the men accused who could have been tortured, giving his lowly birth, and he was also the only one who ever actually admitted to sleeping with the Queen. The other men who were later accused alongside Anne and Mark Smeaton were the aforementioned Francis Weston, George Boleyn and Henry Norris, and then rounding it out was William Brereton, men who coincidentally were all opponents of Cromwell and his policies. Cromwell examined Anne's ladies-in-waiting and slowly but surely pieced together a narrative which would bring the Queen down. As this went on, Anne herself was completely ignorant of the trap in which she would shortly fall, although evidence suggests that she also harboured concerns for her and her daughter's well-being, instructing her chaplain, Matthew Parker, to look after Princess Elizabeth should anything bad happen to Anne. And so whilst Anne was unaware of just how precarious her position was soon to be, some sense of impending doom had been crossing her mind. 
One of the biggest questions regarding Anne's downfall is whether Cromwell took the initiative on single-handedly or whether he was covertly instructed to do it by the king. It is a question that has split historians ever since Anne's death. Eustace Chapuis reported that Cromwell had been authorised and commissioned by the king to prosecute and bring an end to the mistress's trial, to which he had taken considerable trouble, and that he set himself to devise and conspire the said affair. And so whilst this statement makes it clear that Cromwell cooked up the story, it also implies that he did so on the king's orders. At the end of April 1536, Cromwell returned to the court and sought an audience with the king. Although we do not know exactly what happened in this meeting, thereafter Henry authorised Cromwell to gather further evidence and bring the matter to a trial, and so we can deduce that it was during that meeting that Cromwell either told the king of what he had discovered, or may have even presented him with the evidence that he had already brought together. Now without fresh evidence coming to light, it is unlikely that we will ever know the exact truth as to what the origins of Anne Boleyn's downfall were and in any case, it ultimately wouldn't change the fact that the Queen and the five men accused alongside her would all suffer execution. Anne and her brother George stood trial on Monday the 15th of May, whilst the other four men accused with them were condemned on the Friday beforehand. The five men were executed on the 17th of May 1536, and on the same day, Thomas Cranmer declared Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn as invalid on the basis of Henry's former sexual relationship with Anne's sister, Mary, a ruling which by extension illegitimised their daughter, Princess Elizabeth. Two days later, on the 19th of May 1536, Queen Anne was herself executed, becoming the first queen consort in English history to suffer the ultimate punishment. Even though he was fundamental to Anne's downfall, there was still some measure of respect there, for when Cromwell was asked for his opinion on Anne Boleyn, he summed her up by saying, intelligence, spirit, courage. On the 30th of May, the king married Jane Seymour, and in June, a new parliament passed the second act of succession, securing the rights of any children born to Queen Jane as heirs to the throne. Cromwell's position was now stronger than ever. He succeeded Anne Boleyn's father, Thomas Boleyn, 1st Earl of Wiltshire, as Lord Privy Seal on the 2nd of July 1536, and just six days later he was raised to the peerage, being made Baron Cromwell of Wimbledon. In July 1536, the first attempt was made to clarify religious doctrine after the break from Rome. Bishop Edward Fox tabled proposals in convocation with strong backing from Cromwell and Cranmer, which the King later endorsed as the Ten Articles and which were printed in August 1536. Cromwell circulated injunctions for their enforcement, which proved to be deeply unpopular with huge swathes of the common people and would eventually lead to major political unrest in September and October across the Midlands and the north of England, a period which has become known as the Pilgrimage of Grace, which also found support among the gentry and even the more conservative members of the nobility. The rebels' grievances were wide-ranging, but the most significant was the suppression of the monasteries, for which the blame fell flatly at the king's evil counsellors, principally Cromwell and also Thomas Cranmer, not the king himself. The uprising was quickly brought down, but undoubtedly was the first major chink in Cromwell's hitherto gleaming armour, for it showed the king just how despised his policies were, policies that had been orchestrated by Cromwell. The putting down of the pilgrimage of grace also weakened Cromwell further by the fact that a privy council had been gathered to plot how the pilgrimage could be brought down. Cromwell may have been incredibly clever and he may have amassed a big workforce, but this workforce was made up of scribes and law writers, not soldiers. The old nobility of England, people such as the Duke of Norfolk or the Marquis of Exeter, by virtue of their great estate, also held large numbers of fighting men in their ranks. They had experience of war and would be able to provide men to the king to crush the rebellion, and this was something that Cromwell himself was unable to provide. He would also have to contend with this group of men being a constant presence, and they were a danger, for they held no love for Cromwell and his progressive ways. Even so, the king continued to support his chief minister, 
and confirmed his support of Cromwell further by appointing him to the most noble order of the Garter on the 5th of August 1537, the most senior order of knighthood in the English honours system, which it still is to this day. Although Henry VIII had willingly gone along with the dissolution of the monasteries and the major religious changes in England which Cromwell orchestrated, he was at heart still a fervent Catholic, just one in a version of Catholicism of his own making. He was never truly comfortable with the extent of the religious changes that Cromwell and Cranmer made, and as such was susceptible to the influence of the more conservative factions at court who championed the traditional forms of the Catholic faith. This group was made up in large part by a group known as the White Rose Families for their strong ties to the Yorkist branch of the Plantagenets, and they were regaining a lot of strength and influence at the court. And so in a repeat of Cromwell's actions against Anne Boleyn, he set his sights on destroying the White Rose Families. Now conveniently for Cromwell, the White Rose Network all had a lot of royal blood in their veins, none more so than the powerful Pole family, headed up by the family matriarch, Margaret Countess of Salisbury, a niece of Kings Edward IV and Richard III, and Edward Courtenay, Marquess of Exeter, a grandson of Edward IV. Henry VIII never truly felt secure on his throne, and so Cromwell took the initiative against his enemies to get them out of the picture leaning heavily on Henry's paranoia about being ousted by extended members of his family, such as the Poles and the Courtenays. Based on little more than mere gossip, Cromwell imprisoned the Marquess of Exeter, Henry Pole, Baron Montague, Geoffrey Pole, Sir Edward Neville and Sir Nicholas Carew on charges of high treason in what has become known as the Exeter Conspiracy, which at its crux looked to oust the king and place the Marquess of Exeter on the throne using evidence acquired from Sir Geoffrey Pole under interrogation in the Tower of London. Soon all of the men bar Geoffrey would be dead. Two years later, Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, would also die for her supposed part in the conspiracy. Few historians believe that there was any real threat to the king by the White Rose Network, and having written a book on the Pole family myself, I am broadly of the same opinion. Something else that Cromwell would become greatly involved in was Henry's love life. The king's third wife, Jane, had died in 1537, less than two weeks after the birth of her only child, the king's Longford son, Prince Edward. In October 1539, the king finally accepted Cromwell's suggestion that he should marry Anna of Cleves, a sister of Duke Wilhelm of Cleves, partly on the basis of a portrait which Hans Holbein had painted of her. For Cromwell, the marriage was also beneficial to his plans for further religious reform, for Cleves had shaken off adherence to the Pope in Rome, and thus would be a useful ally for England and its independence from the clutches of the Holy See. On the 27th of December, Anna of Cleves arrived in Dover and met the King for the first time on New Year's Eve 1539. The meeting did not go well, for Anna did not recognise Henry, which to be fair to her wasn't really her fault, for Henry VIII had arrived in disguise to surprise her, but for the king her ignorance of his little game utterly transformed the appeal that he felt for her as his fourth wife. After the meeting he was heard screaming at Cromwell, I like her not, I like her not. Now whilst beauty is in the eye of the beholder, it is unlikely that Anna of Cleves was as ugly as history has painted her. She was certainly unlike her namesake, the glamorous and petite Anne Boleyn, for Anna was said to be quite tall, and she was also wearing the unflattering Germanic fashions of her homeland at the time, but this did not matter. Unfortunately for the king, there was no going back. Cromwell's treaties with Cleves had been watertight. He had signed the agreement with the Duke of Cleves and was on a bound to move ahead with the marriage. Now this isn't to suggest that the king didn't try to break it apart, on several occasions, the king summoned his ministers and attempted to find a loophole out of the marriage, but when none was forthcoming, it was said that he told Cromwell furiously, is there none other remedy than I must needs against my will put my neck in the yoke? The marriage went ahead, but was not consummated, the king complaining of evil smells about her and commented on the looseness of her breast, which was seen in the 16th century to be a sign that a woman was not a virgin. The king also reported to one of his servants that her appearance did little to excite him, and thus he left her as good a maid as he found her. In reality though, only one person smelt bad in that bedroom, and it wasn't Anna. 
it was the king. Although the marriage to Anna of Cleves is generally regarded as being the final straw in the relationship between Henry and Cromwell, this is not quite accurate. For three months later, on the 18th of April 1540, Henry granted Cromwell the Earldom of Essex and the senior court office of Lord Great Chamberlain. These were huge honours, and Earldom was the third most senior rank in the nobility, and so this suggests that at this point at least, Cromwell still held major royal favour. As ever with Henry VIII though, it would not last. Cromwell's tenure as the king's chief minister was nearing its end, and although it seemed like he managed to successfully avoid the drama of the failed marriage with Cleves, Cromwell's enemies, most prominently Thomas Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk, had been waiting patiently for such a disaster to befall Cromwell and would use it as the basis for his undoing. The king's anger at being manoeuvred into marrying Anna of Cleves was the opportunity that Cromwell's conservative opponents, most notably the Duke of Norfolk, had been hoping for. Ironically, however, the start of Cromwell's downfall owes as much to his own behaviour as anyone else's. Henry VIII had always been a prickly and profoundly proud man, the years and years of not producing a healthy, legitimate son had done huge damage to his pride, as had the fact that he was no longer the handsome and muscular man of his youth, but was now grossly overweight and plagued by ill health. Scratching around for a reason to have the marriage with Anna annulled, the king had confided in Cromwell that he had been unable to consummate the marriage, and he allowed Cromwell to impart this information to William Fitzwilliam, 1st Earl of Southampton, who, as Lord Admiral, had conveyed Anna from Calais over into England. Back home, Cromwell grew uncertain on how best to deal with the Cleves' marriage, and so he also told Thomas Risley, his principal secretary, who had also served the king in various important positions, of the king's inability to sleep with Anna. Soon, the news was all over the court, and was massively humiliating for the king, for it was effectively a suggestion that the king couldn't get it up. Both Southampton and Risley made sure that it was Cromwell who was blamed for the indiscretion, which naturally infuriated Henry VIII. A long-discussed alliance between France and the Holy Roman Emperor, which would have been contrary to England's interests, had failed to materialise, and so the king took the initiative to solidify his relationship with France by sending the Duke of Norfolk to the French court to meet with King Francis I and offer England support in his unresolved dispute with Emperor Charles V. King Francis received the idea favourably, which in turn changed the balance of power back into England's favour. It also highlighted that Cromwell's earlier foreign policy of wooing support from the Duchy of Cleves, which in turn humiliated the king, was ultimately unnecessary. More pressing was the possibility of war arising between the Duke of Cleves and Charles V, which if it had come to fruition, would have seen Henry trapped to support Cleves by his new alliance, and in so doing been at war with France. Although Cromwell and Stephen Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester, had held a relatively cordial relationship until this point, the latter remained committed to the traditional forms of Catholicism, and felt that the reforms that Cromwell put into place had gone too far. He therefore gave his support to the Duke of Norfolk, and the two began their campaign to utterly destroy Thomas Cromwell. They were helped by the appearance of Norfolk's niece, Catherine Howard, who the Duke had cleverly placed into the household of Anna of Cleves, and who quickly caught the King's attention. Having sufficiently convinced the King that Cromwell had to go, the council, led by Norfolk, pounced. As Cromwell arrived at a council meeting in Westminster on the 10th of June, he was accused of various charges and arrested. His enemies took every opportunity to humiliate him, with the Duke of Norfolk in particular getting a sadistic pleasure out of finally destroying the man that he had loathed for years. He snatched at the St George's collar, the insignia of the Order of the Garter that Cromwell wore about his shoulders, saying, a traitor must not wear it. Cromwell's initial reaction was one of shock and defiance, crying out, this then is my reward for faithful service. Ultimately, it did him no good, and he was taken by barge to the Tower of London and imprisoned. 
a bill of attainder containing a long list of indictments including supporting Anabaptists, corrupt practices, leniency in matters of justice, acting for personal gain and even attempting to marry the Lady Mary, the King's daughter, was put to the House of Lords and a week later it was passed on the 29th of June 1540. Given Cromwell's encyclopedic knowledge of the law, it seems likely to me that his accusers were unwilling to allow him to come to trial, knowing full well that he would be able to mount such sturdy responses that they'd have struggled to deliver a conviction, and so they took the coward's way out and had him made guilty without the need for a trial. All of Cromwell's honours and goods were forfeited to the Crown. From being made Earl of Essex just three months earlier, he was now back to simple Thomas Cromwell. Ever a man to turn any situation to his advantage, the king deferred the execution until his marriage to Anna of Cleves could be annulled, purely because the king needed Cromwell's input to have the annulment made legal. Henry got his desired annulment, and he got it with no fuss from Anna, who was treated with great generosity for being so willing to go quietly. Hoping for clemency, Cromwell wrote to his former master from his cell in the tower in what would be his final letter to the king. He signed it off, Most gracious prince, I cry for mercy, mercy, mercy. Now whether he hoped that this letter would spare his life, or he was hoping that it would move the king into commuting the death sentence to decapitation, rather than the more protracted agony of hanging, drawing and quartering, is unknown. If it was the latter, then it worked, for Cromwell was soon advised that he would suffer the quicker death by beheading which was conducted on Tower Hill on the 28th of July 1540, the very same day that Henry VIII walked up the aisle with Norfolk's teenage niece, Catherine Howard. On the scaffold, Cromwell prayed and gave a speech in which he told the onlookers that he died in the traditional Catholic faith, before denying that he had ever aided heretics. Sadly, although the king had commuted the execution to a simple beheading, it would not go as smoothly as Cromwell had hoped for. Whether the regular tower headsman was unavailable or if he was just having a bad day is unknown, but what is generally accepted is that the execution was severely botched, with several strikes of the axe being needed to sever Cromwell's head. Afterwards, Cromwell's head would suffer the indignity of being impaled on a spike on London Bridge. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, King Henry VIII came to greatly regret killing Cromwell and later accused his ministers of bringing about Cromwell's downfall by pretexts and false accusations. The French ambassador, Charles de Marillac, reported in a letter that the king was now said to be lamenting his decision, going so far as to say that under the pretext of some slight offences which he had committed, that they had brought about several accusations against him on the strength of which he had put to death the most faithful servant he had ever had. Thomas Cromwell is undoubtedly one of the most fascinating and divisive figures from the Tudor era. His hand in bringing down Anne Boleyn and his poor treatment of the religious houses casts an understandable shadow over his memory, but I do not believe that he was the great evil villain that history has painted him to be. And although I know the work of the late Dame Hilary Mantel is semi-fictionalised, I appreciate that she has tried to tell another side of his story. It's thanks to Mantell's Wolf Hall trilogy that interest in Cromwell has undergone something of a resurgence in the past decade, and also that the man himself is now viewed as more human than the villainous caricature of the past. Despite his many bad deeds, I have to admit that I do have a bit of a soft spot for Cromwell. I get the sense that he would have been the kind of guy who you could have a laugh with. Let me put it this way, I'd have rather seen him down the pub for a beer than I would Thomas More. His significance in English history cannot be overstated. It was remarkable what he achieved. The son of a blacksmith from Putney, who turned the kingdom upside down and set in store governance, which can still be felt to this day. And so that brings me to the end of this week's episode of the Tudor Chess Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Next week, I am thrilled to say that I'm going to be joined by historian Dr. Elizabeth Norton, who will be discussing King Henry VIII's final wife, Catherine Parr, with me, as well as sharing her experience of being a historical consultant on the upcoming film Firebrand, starring Alicia Vikander in the role of Catherine Parr and Jude Law in the role of Henry VIII. Thank you again for your support of The Tudor Chest, and speak soon. 